Thank you for the Royal Institute for having me and thank you all for attending. So uh, we'll be talking about mind wandering today following the publication of my book and, and uh, many years of research that I would love to share with you all. So the human brain, uh, as you see here, that's a, that's a drawing that I like. This is the left hemisphere looked from inside. So it's a medial view and these are the cortex, the foldings of the cortex. This is called corpus callosum. You don't really need to remember these names or even hear them well enough. I'm just giving you some pointers here. So this is the, what the, the fibers that connect the left and the right hemispheres. Uh, this is the goes to the brain stem. This is the cerebellum that in, involves in memory and, and some more, uh, movement. Generally, the, this mysterious organ that fascinates us and that is really uh, who we are and we try to understand it for many decades now. So the main element of, uh, I'll just give you a quick review of, uh, of brain research, just really a couple of slides and then uh, dive into more state of mind and mind wandering. So the main element in a brain is a neuron, a brain cell that's called neuron, right? So even though it, there's a whole cosmos of activities and events and, and substance and, cha and chains of uh, occurrences inside a single brain, as a single neuron, let's just look at the neuron as a switch, a switch that can go on or, on or off. It has many inputs and it has one output, the exon. And depending on the configuration of the inputs that are connected to other neurons, this specific neuron will decide whether to fire or not. It, it fires a, a pulse that we call action potential. And with this, it signals something to the neurons that it is connected to, okay? So on an average brain, there are about 100 mil, uh, billion neurons, okay? And these 100 billion neurons, each one of them is connected to about 10,000 other neurons. So it's a massive network. So on the one hand, a single neuron is like a switch, very simple operation, uh, if we think about it. But at the same time, it's a massive network. And there are different kinds of neurons, uh, the families of neurons, and they're portrayed very uh, beautifully by uh, the anatomist Ramonica Hall. But basically, we think about this massive network of neurons that help us accomplish all these complicated things, some of which I'll highlight in a second. So when we as scientists like to study the brain, one approach is neurophysiology, where we actually insert an electrode and measure activity from individual neurons. Okay, so the, the uh, uh, experimentalist measures here, and this information goes to a scope in the lab where we can actually measure these pulses. Okay, so these lines are like the action potentials we showed you, I showed you before. And now we're facing with the issue of not having a user's manual, but having a train of action potentials as response for various stimuli. And we have to understand to decipher what information is conveyed by this neuron just by looking at this firing and, and what is it connected to. So this is, a, this, is, this is why it's such a mystery that, that you can see how complex is the problem. But still, uh, we have to try to infer from this, how does the brain do, do all these amazing things that we've gotten used to or taking for granted, but when you pause for a second to think about it, it's actually uh, pretty admirable. So the fact that we can really recognize objects, faces, individuals, expressions, and so forth, uh, you can't really understand how complex the problem is until you try to imitate it on a computer or try to really be concrete about the mechanism. Not only that we can recognize uh, per perceptual sensory information around us, we can also operate on a very semantic level. We can look at this uh, uh, young girl here and then a young woman and then realize when we are faced with other stimuli that although there are some physical similarities between two st these two images, especially in the hair, we know they represent completely different concepts, whereas with these two images uh, look very differently but represent the same context. So the brain can do all these layers and hierarchical uh, processing of very complex information, as you know. Another interesting thing that the brain can, can do and is a little bit more relevant to the topic of our conversation today is the issue of attention. So we're on a constant basis bombarded with information with, through all our senses, noises, sounds, lights, colors, um, smells, and all this stimulation comes at us. And we have still limited capacity as much as uh, I think the brain is amazing, still it is limited in how much it can do. And to do this uh, in a sane way, in an efficient way, what nature has instilled in us is a, is a mechanism that filters the information so we can attend selectively things that interest us and ignore everything else. 
And through detailed uh, 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 research, we know now that when we attend something, it's really like a flashlight, a spotlight, as a very uh, uh, um, limited area in space where we amplify the information, whereas we, uh, we attenuate or, or suppress the information outside that's not of relevance for us. In fact, this mechanism is so efficient that we are not only uh, ignoring things that are not in the spotlight of our attention, we completely are blind to them. And this thing is so easily demonstrated that even uh, advertisers are taking advantage of it. I'll show you a quick commercial for, I have no relationship to these car companies, and I don't think it's a special car in any way, but the commercial is fascinating in the sense that it, it takes advantage of your attentional capacity to really attend one thing and ignore all the others. And this demonstration is so strong that I can tell you up front that the whole street in front of you is going to be changing and it will be very hard for you to see this in action. So the narrator will, will confuse you and then at the end we'll show you all the changes that have been made to this scene. So just pay attention for a minute or two. To test just how much attention the attention-stealing design of the new Skoda Fabia actually steals, we left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Well, not quite. But did the attention-stealing design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us? Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pig? Let alone the fact that the entire street is now completely different. Didn't think so. So there we have it, proof that the new Skoda Fabia is truly attention stealing. So independent of the specific car, the specific commercial, you, you realize how easy it is to fool us and uh, to make us not see things in our very environment just because we're so attentive of specific item. And I think it's related to many things that might have attracted you to this talk specifically, our inability to attend what we want to attend or to notice things in our environment, even though we should have. So whatever we don't, we don't attend, we generally miss. So this attention mechanism and filter is ingenious in how much it helps us, but it can also hurt us like many other trade-offs in, in the, the way the brain works. Let me give you another example of how uh, amazing our brain is or your brain is. So if I ask you to, um, try to recognize what's in this poor image, it is built such that nobody can, can really uh, tell what it is. And I have experience with this picture, so I won't entertain guesses now. Uh, trust me that <laughs> it's made to be impossible. But this is not a demonstration. Demonstration is the following. I'm going to show you what the picture really is. Okay. Everybody sees the horse. And now you look at the original picture again. None of you has a problem recognizing the horse now. And Think about what just happened. Your brain in two seconds of exposure changed, not completely, but something in your brain changed and changed for a long term now. Uh, this is called plasticity. And now you cannot even unsee this horse here. You cannot go back to the, to the uh, um, state you were before where you couldn't recognize it. So our brain, even into older age, is still plastic. And every little conversation or something new that we learn, something that interests us, change our brain a little bit and uh, by adding this information. Okay. And in general, thinking about how this massive network of switches of neurons can accomplish uh, glorious things such as consciousness, appreciating beauty, feeling pain, happiness, uh, and love. So this is really, these are the big questions that interest us uh, when we study the brain. And to study the brain, we actually... Um, use different approaches. So in a certain center like ours and, and many centers around the world, there are people that study the brain from different perspectives. It could be the lower level, the molecules, the neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine that you've heard of, or some electrophysiology where you actually uh, and, and, uh, implant an electrode, uh, stick an electrode and measure these action potentials I talked about, or putting people, individuals, participants, inside, a, for example, an MRI machine and measuring what happens in the brain when our individual subjects 
uh, for example, look at faces or look at nouns versus verbs. And, and in addition, we also have computational and, 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 and other uh, theoretical scientists with us that think about models in a more computational manner. So it's really such a complex problem that it really uh, necessitate a multidisciplinary approach. So this is by way of background of, of brain research in general that I'm sure was uh, familiar already to most of you. But we specifically will be talking today about mind wandering, that what are our minds do when there is no task, when there's, there's nothing in front of us that really consumes, consumes us, that really requires all of our attention and our processing abilities, what does happen in the brain when we wander? So I'll, I'll just list a few that I'm sure you can uh, list yourself as well. So we're engaged in planning, in creating predictions about the future, uh, mental simulations. I'll expand about this a little bit, but these kind of mini movies that we run in our mind in order to foresee certain outcomes and to help us with making decisions. Uh, there's also bedside, bad aspects to uh, mind wandering, and some of them include worrying and ruminating, like it happens often in mood disorders, such as depression, but in general, some anxieties that are not fruitful, but nevertheless occupy our mind. Thinking about the self and thinking about others, including their intentions, etc. Problem solving, that's another big uh, uh, process that takes place while, while we wander. Creative incubation, I think that's an exciting one, how we actually come up with creative solutions to problems. And sometimes uh, it happens behind, our, behind the scenes or behind our conscious perception or conscious uh, awareness. And we'll be talking about this as well. So fantasizing, of course, and state of mind in general. Our state of mind is represented by this uh, default network or by, by this uh, mind ordering uh, activation. And I will... Um, dive deeper into state of mind in the following slides, okay? So state of mind in general, let me just give you a more formal definition or a more formal uh, understanding of what I mean by state of mind because it is a very intuitive term as it is. Uh, so our mind is dynamic. I don't think it's a big secret. I don't think it's a big surprise, but our mind can have different states. It can change and, and it's important for us to recognize this and be able to understand what is each state good for. It is overarching in the sense that uh, whatever is our state in one type of cognitive processing, it is all the, our entire state, and it really encompasses more than one dimension of our mental being. It is determined by context. It could be external context, what is the situation we're in, what are the demands, but it also can also be internal context, like your mood, for example, would affect your, your uh, state of mind. So there, are, there is a state of mind, there, are, there is a right state of mind for, for a certain occasion, and we do want to minimize the friction uh, minimize the friction between state of mind and the environment. So what is the best state of mind for the thing you're facing now? Be it uh, talking to your daughter or uh, sitting in a library or having a discussion with somebody or sitting in a movie or trying to solve a problem. There is a state of mind that's appropriate for optimizing our performance in a specific task. So we should be minded of our state of mind and whether it's the state of mind that's most appropriate for the specific thing we want to do. So let me talk about uh, some major dimensions in our um, cognitive and, and, and mental lives. And I want to emphasize specifically how each one of them is a continuum. So take perception, for example, the way we respond to our environment, to our physical environment, to the sight of a red triangle or to the smell of some ice cream or a flower. Uh, so the subjective feeling is that our perception is what we call veridical, that we actually perceive the world as it is, as uh, Immanuel Kant called it, the thing in itself. But the thing is not uh, as accurate. And the, and the issue is that we have accumulated information in our, you know, uh, the result of our experience that resides in our memory. And this, uh, res this memory helps us understand our environment and facilitate our interaction. That, this is how we take advantage of our experience. So we learn something in the past and we utilize it on a moment by moment basis to help us also perceive the environment. So when you enter a kitchen, you know to expect that there will be a stove there. This will help you recognize the stove when you're actually entering this kitchen and might even distort to some extent the way you see this stove because of your expectation. So perception, unlike our intuitive and subjective uh, percep uh, feeling of it, is actually a combination of what comes to us through the senses and what is already in our memory in expectation so that at any given moment perception can be more or less a result of the sensory input versus what's already in memory. 
So this is one dimension. And as I said, there is a continuum here. It could be uh, mostly sensory or mostly based on memory and experience and anywhere in between. So this idea of continuum is important to keep in mind here. The second dimension is attention I just told you about. I just showed you with this uh, demonstration. So attention can be um, to global or to local details, for example. We can be seeing the forest or we can be seeing the trees. These are different states and these are different ends of a continuum of attention. So you can be very localized or very global, right? So there's another continuum here. The third dimension that is also uh, a continuum is the scope of our thought. So think about thought as jumping on the node of a giant neural network that we have of all the things we know. So a, a chain of thought is really jumping from one node to the next. So if you imagine this train of thought and you imagine this network, you can think about this network or this, or this train of thought traveling in circles around the same topic, or really is it uh, traveling far and fast in this network? So it can be narrow in the scope that it spans, or it can be broadly associative and expanding and going further in, in our thoughts. Openness to experience is another domain. So we can be, and I will uh, uh, unpack these, these terms here that are critical for the rest of the talk. So we can be on the one hand in an exploitation state of mind, which means we really want to exploit the familiar. We prefer things we know, things that are safe, the things that are routine, things that we know the outcome of. And in this condition, we actually learn less, we experience less novelty, but at the same time, we're safer and we're more efficient. So this is the one end of this continuum. On the other end of this continuum, there is exploration. We could be exploratory in the sense that we seek thrills, seek, seek novelty, want to learn new things, want to experience uh, uh, new, uh, new experiences. So these are two ends or two extremes of the same uh, uh, dimension of openness to experience. And of course, there is also mood or affect that can be negative on one hand or positive on the other hand. So these are the major dimensions of cognition. And as I just show you here, each one of them can be characterized as a continuum. So there's really, um, you can look at it as each, each dimension, perception, attention, thought, openness to experience and affect can be sliding on this dimension from one end to the next. Okay, so let me just, um, Detail just for a second, each of these dimensions a little further. So perception, as I said, can be bottom up or top down. So bottom up means based on the senses, as I said before. So the information comes from the bottom, from the senses and goes higher and higher in our cortex, all the way to our understanding of, of how things are. But perception can also be aided by top down information, this memory and experience I just talked about, where in for higher level information kind of trickles down to help perception in some way based on, on previous experience. So the issue here is that really is perception more based on senses or based on memory. And as I said, in every given moment, it is some kind of a combination with different emphasis, sometimes more towards the senses and sometimes towards uh, memory. So let me just give you a quick example or two. So this is a famous uh, uh, demonstration in psychology called the Kanitsa Triangle. So there are only three uh, uh, Pacmans here, but they are oriented in a way that give you the impression that there's actually a triangle here, whereas there is actually no uh, triangle here. But we all see lines here, depending on the strength of, of the display or whatever, but this thing has been working uh, reliably for ages that we see things that are not there. We expect to see a triangle and we see a triangle, even though there isn't. Even neurons that are sensitive to lines in this orientation would respond as if there is a line there. So there's no way for you to see a triangle here if your perception were only uh, uh, based on the senses, because based on the senses, the thing in itself is only three Pacmans, but we actually, the top-down information, our expectation, our experience with angles that are oriented like that, Something inside tells us there's a triangle and we actually see the triangle. You can also see, look at the demonstration on the right. So the inner circles are exactly the same size, but we perceive them differently just because of the circles that are around them. So you see again that our perception is not veridical, it's not really based only on the physical properties of our environment, but is already, uh, but is also uh, largely biased by our previous knowledge and previous expectations. 
So this is the state of mind. Uh, this was uh, uh, the, the element of perception in state of mind. The element of attention, as I said before, global versus local. This is the trees versus the forest. You can look at these figures. They're called Navon figures. So you can look at either the big picture here and say S, or you can look at the small features here and say F, right? So you can see the global or you can see the local, depending on the scope. Interestingly, uh, humans usually see the global first. It's called global precedence effect and only afterwards see details. So uh, that's another issue of state of mind, uh, the level of attention and the breadth of this attention spotlight. The third dimension I mentioned before is thought. Thought can be associative or ruminative, right? So ruminative is a, rumination is really the extreme, but it can be broad or it can be narrow. This is the, the, the way we think. We can be focused on the same issue, on the same problem for a long time, or we can be jumping to from one note to a further note to a further note and jump very far and be exploratory inward, exploratory in how we think in the sense that we, we, um, we venture to distant uh, places in this uh, semantic network that we have in memory and think more broadly. So what determines the breadth, just like I was talking about the breadth of attention, now the breadth of thought, what determines the breadth of thought is something that is called inhibition. So we tend to think about the brain really in terms of excitation, that we see or hear something and neurons are excited and responding. But actually inhibition is a, is a force that is equally important to excitation in the sense that it helps us prune, it helps us inhibit and self-control. And how, how do I know not to say certain things in this specific forum, but uh, maybe they're appropriate in another form. There's something in, in my mind, this is high level information that inhibits certain behaviors and, and, and allows other types of, of behaviors. But it also affects how far and how broad we go with our association, with our thinking, with our mind wandering. So let me just uh, give a, a, a specific example of how inhibition works. So think about having in your um, memory the a representation of a cup of coffee. Okay, so let's say this, this is how it looks in your memory. And from your experience, the cup of coffee is associated with these items like a coffee machine, sugar, uh, uh, coffee beans, etc. right? So these are associations that are immediately related to the cup of coffee. And it makes sense that when you see the cup of coffee, you also see all these associates or at least expect them and predict them. The thing is that each of these items is also associated with a bunch of other, um, a bunch of other items, and you see this uh, a portion of, of the network that each of us have in our in our brains. Of course, with different connections depending on our experience. So now the question is: when when I see a cup of coffee, it's okay to predict sugar and coffee maker and uh, some kind of a donut or, of, or or coffee beans. This is relevant, and it's actually the activation of this association forms some sort of a prediction. But because of all these connections, we also see that a cup of coffee somehow is related also to barbells, right? To some kind of workout. You don't want to be thinking about barbells every time that you think about a cup of coffee, right? So some, something in your brain has to limit the extent of activation of these thoughts, of these associations. And this thing is, a, is an inhibition. We want just the right amount of inhibition, not too little and not too much just to activate those associations that will turn out to be fruitful in a specific context so they can help us anticipate what is going to unfold around us. So if we think about the brain proper, there is the medial prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is here in the front, and it is really the most advanced part in our brain, and it's most uh, this the area that, that finishes to mature the most, uh, the latest, around the mid twenties, and this area has been has been shown to kind of be the CEO of the brain, and it really sends down control commands. And one of the controls that it does, it really generates this inhibition to limit in the medial temporal lobe uh, the extent of our association. So you can see these arrows represent the train of thought. So we really uh, advance from one thought to the next kind of freely, we don't go overboard. We don't wanna be overly associative like people with schizophrenia are, but we do want to be associative. We don't wanna be limited in the extent that we can spread up the wings of our thought. People with depression, for example, have too much inhibition. This hyper inhibition, when the, MP, when the media prefrontal cortex does this in the wrong way, there's too much inhibition on our associations. And as a result, we cannot really expand with our thoughts and we're limited to a, a, a narrow topic. And this can result in rumination. And when it is chronic, when it happens long enough, this is uh, associated with depression and, and uh, anxiety. So from this, there is a, uh, the, the 
it's not a hypothesis anymore. I mean, we did, we and others have shown support for this, that mood is directly linked to how associative or inhibited are our mental processes. So really the, the breadth of thought and the mood are uh, tightly linked to each other. So how expansive is our thought pattern can affect how good we feel in terms of mood. So really rumination versus a more broad associative activation. And this starts to get into the mind wandering in a broad mind or mind wandering that's conducive of a better mood versus narrow uh, thinking that is uh, more associated with rumination and maybe with mood disorders. The fourth um, element of uh, state of mind is what I mentioned before, the openness to experience. And here I mentioned before the exploration versus exploitation. And really that what, dif what differentiates between them is our tolerance for uncertainty. When we're in an exploratory state of mind, when we want to explore, to experience, to, to learn, we are willing to tolerate some uncertainty. We sacrifice some of our safety for the sake of experiencing and learning. So this is one state to be in. The other extreme is really to not tolerate uncertainty, to seek the safety and protection, and therefore not to venture beyond our comfort zone. I, I know every time I describe this, the exploration always sounds more glorious, but we really need both and we do slide between them. So there are conditions where being exploitatory is better and there are conditions, situations where exploratory uh, wins. So in exploratory, as I said, there's a wider scope of how we examine and consume our environment. We are oriented towards learn, learning and we are tuned more to the novel, inf to novel information. In exploratory state of mind, we rely on existing knowledge and expectations. We're less open to surprises and we gravitate to the details. An optimal state of mind for creativity, for example, to thrive would be a result of balancing these two forces. And when we talk about creativity later on, I'll talk about how we actually need this, uh, both this state of mind in order to accomplish a creative solution. So we really need uh, uh, all these things and it's just a question of when is best to be in what. So again, this uh, diagram that I showed you before that there are all these dimensions and they can slide. And the big uh, issue here is that they're actually connected. That we, through uh, uh, a lot of research, not only in my lab, but also in uh, several others, uh, have shown all these correlations between all these dimensions of cognition. And we came to the conclusion that they're all actually tied together and together form our state of mind. So when our perception is on the left here, all the way to the left to the broad state of mind, then also attention, thought, openness to experience and affect will also be on the same side. Okay, And when we, we gravitate towards the narrow state of mind where perception relies more on predictions, for example, then attention will be more local and thought will be more narrowly associative and will be more exploitatory and our effect will be toward, more towards the negative. So the big deal here is not only that we have individual dimensions to cognition and not only that they are each a continuum, but rather that they are all clustered together and they move in tandem and this is our state of mind. Where are we on this when we slide really affects all these dimensions of our mental lives. But thankfully, we're rarely, if ever, at one extreme. We're always sliding, but we can, it's just a matter of proportion. And as a result of this, the same individual can exhibit substantial changes under different states. So it's the same person, I'm not talking about different person, uh, individuals here. An individual in a happy mood will tend to have a broader associative thinking style broader attention scope and inclined towards exploring her environment. So this is the broad state of mind. In another state of mind, under negative mood, the same individual will tend to be to a more rigid uh, thinking style, narrowed attention scope, and rely on exploiting familiar information and habitual behaviors. This is the narrow state of mind. And you should keep it in mind that it's the same person can really be in these two different states. These two paragraphs seem as if I described two different individuals, but it's all of us. We have our own a little slide within our own uh, individual range. So there are a couple of implications to this uh, framework that I would like to highlight. One of them is that personality is really not a destiny. So we do have personality. Not everybody can become Leonardo da Vinci when they are in the right state of mind. So, but we do have a range. So a, cer a certain person can be less creative now, but more creative later, depending on context and depending on many other aspects, right? So it is not really, we're not doomed to whatever we think we are, but rather there is a condition and there is a situation that can accentuate uh, one uh, trait versus the other. The second thing is that um, 
load, cognitive load, I'll explain it in a second what it means, and, and other, other uh, activities, mental activities that might tax our overall mental capacity can affect things such as creativity. So for example, let, let me just give you an example of uh, one of the st studies that's, that started this research program in my lab. We had subjects um, engage in a free association task. You give a word to your subject, like a shoe, and then they say sock as quickly as possible. So they have to come up with the first association that comes to their mind. But before starting this free association session, we had subjects remember keeping in mind a number throughout the experiment. So participants in one condition had to remember a short, a short number, so two digits, like the 43 here. And the participants in the other condition had to remember a long string that is akin to load. It kind of uh, taxes their mental capacity and takes away some of, of what is available by having to keep in mind this long digit. This, this long uh, number, right? And it turned out that people in, in the condition where they had less load, their less cognitive load, provided more regional associations. So when you're less uh, occupied mentally by things that can be mundane, it doesn't have to be uh, uh, worries on, or anxieties. It could be just as mundane as a grocery list. If this is something that you need to keep in mind, it's already a tax that takes away from your abilities to do anything else especially creativity. Interestingly, people have shown also that such load can also affect your ability to appreciate aesthetics even. So looking at the same picture when you're loaded, mentally loaded or not, uh, can affect how much you appreciate what's, what's in front of you. And again, a load is not something that's reserved for a lab a condition. We are always bombarded with information that we need to keep in mind, things that worry us, levels of stress, and things that really require some of our attention and leave us with less for being creative or for being appreciative of what's around us. So mind wandering proper. So uh, as I think was advertised uh, before this talk, or you might have heard it before, about half of our waking hours are dedicated for wandering. So we are somewhere else. If you think about it, it's pretty stunning. About half of our waking hours, our mind is not here, it's somewhere else. And the question is why? Because I do believe in evolution in the brain and the idea that if, if it works like this and if it is so intense, it must play some key function. And where do we go to and, and how does this happen? So this, this has been a, a big question for the last two decades in neuroscience. Uh, people have been trying to understand uh, what is going on there. Why do we have to go somewhere else with our mind so often? So really what is happening when nothing happens? Uh, so this actually converges with another interesting story in neuroscience, and it's the discovery of what we call the default mode network. Some of you might have heard about it, but let me just uh, explain what it means. So for long years, we as neuroscientists, as a community, assumed implicitly that when people are not engaged in a demanding task, let's say that when we uh, bring them to our lab and put them in an MRI machine and give them a certain task, in between tasks when they're not supposed to be doing anything, we just tell them to rest, uh, we assume that they're really resting, that their brain is really resting. But it turned out uh, that actually there's a massive network of brain regions that is vigorously active when we're not supposed to be doing anything. So it's not really surprising that the brain is active, but the fact is that it's a massive network and it's consistent between individual participants, between experiments, between labs, between continents. This, uh, this uh, finding is, is very well established that we have this massive network that is active continuously when we're not busy uh, and we're fully occupied with something else. So we call this the default mode network just because this is what our brain does by default. It's very active. So for those of us that understand how much energy the brain requires from the body and how much, how big is this network, there ought to be a reason, there ought to be a function for this. And this cannot be uh, just a side effect of not doing anything, but rather it requires a lot of metabolic energy and time and, and, and other types of energy. And there, there better be a reason for why we do this. So this converged really with, my, with mind wandering. So people have shown that uh, mind wandering uh, happens really on the default network. So the default network, this massive uh, network of cortical regions I just showed you, actually is the seat of, of mind wandering. And then it started, began a, a quest to understand, so what is the content of mind wandering? We're so busy doing this and we require so much energy from our brain to be doing this. It must be... Uh, um, 
playing a serious re uh, uh, function, and we have to understand why. And multiple groups have worked on this in different, from different angles, and we have established a few things already. First of all, the default network is where we represent the self. There is such a concept. It's a borderline philosophical, but the whole idea of representing who we are, what we like, what we don't like, how we would respond to certain things, uh, and this is a concept and a construct that really is with us since we were born and kind of grows but, but and becomes more detailed, but it's stable and this is really our identity. So our self is something that is uh, represented by our constant wandering and by, by the default network. And also the self of others. We call it theory of mind because we always theorize what is the intention of this person when they approach us? What is What do they mean by what they told us? Uh, are they happy? Are they sad? Are they here to attack us? Are they here to hug us? All this understanding of others also happens in the default network. And the third thing that's mainly coming from, from my lab is that to what extent the default network is engaged in associative thinking and in running these simulations uh, towards the future based on the past. So associative processing and the generation of predictions and foresight are integral processes of default activity in this proactive, creative brain of ours. So for now we established, let me just uh, summarize at least for myself, just to uh, make sure we're on the same page here. So we've established that there is this giant network that is always active when we're not fully occupied. And it's rare that we're fully occupied. Even when we talk with somebody, there's still some remaining uh, capacity that we can uh, uh, use for wandering, for mind wandering. So, and, there, and mind wandering uh, involves all these processes. The question now is, why does it do so and, and to what extent? So the argument here is that mind wandering is tightly related with our ability to be creative, with creative thinking, okay? And that creative thinking is based on association. So what is the definition of creativity? Actually, very not creative. Uh, so it's a solution that is both novel and useful. A creative solution or creative thought has to be both novel and useful. It's a good working definition. So for example, this object is pretty cool. It's novel, but it's not useful. So this will, wouldn't be judged as a creative uh, watering can just because you can't use it, right? So this doesn't qualify. In general, it has to be uh, novel and useful. And the cre creative process, now we get to uh, uh, down to the interesting uh, decomposition of uh, the creative process into components. So this is not a monolith, just boom, aha, there's a creative solution. There's a lot of work going on here and not all of which uh, we are um, aware of. So basically the creative process has two main uh, stages. The first one is the idea generation, which kind of generating a lot of associations, a lot of solutions, a lot of possibilities. And then there is the stage of evaluation, evaluating logically all these many ideas. So you can think about the creative process as a shape of a diamond. So it starts with what we call divergent thinking, a lot of associations, a lot of possible solution, but then there comes a time where we need to converge. At the end of the day, we actually need to end up with one solution. So we really evaluate all those that were activated during the divergent thinking and converge into a single uh, best solution, okay? So in a sense, in order to achieve uh, the best creative solution, we need to be experiencing two states of mind, right? The divergent thinking that is more akin to the exploratory state that I mentioned before. And then we really need to be exploitatory, we really need to be narrow, we really need to be rational and, and thinking more uh, pragmatically. So you see how the same mind can, should have at least two states uh, in order to really uh, bring this idea home. Creativity and curiosity. I won't be talking much about curiosity here, but in the lab, we are working hard at showing that creativity and curiosity are two sides of the same process. But creativity, uh, at least for this discussion, requires associative, think so, so associative thinking. So we really have to explore all these possibilities in our mind or many possibilities in order to end up with a specific uh, best solution for a problem. And I remind you what I said before about the connection between creativity and mood. So mood is directly linked to how associative we are. And this link is really reciprocal. So being more creative improves mood. That's the claim. And we've been showing it uh, several times and even opened a startup company to try to help people with depression by opening their thought pattern. And it also goes in the other direction. People in a good mood are more creative. And this has been shown uh, much before my time, this direction already. So the idea here, and let me just uh, go through quickly through another experiment that demonstrated that really 
broad thinking improves mood. So if we in the lab, as we did in the past, um, uh, try two conditions of, of showing list of, of, of words, okay? One of them is supposed to emulate rumination. So let's say that the seed or the, the original word is dog, and then we show in a list of words to the subject, uh, one word after the other, but all of them circle around the concept of dog. So they're all legitimate, they're all uh, legitimate associations, they're all connected, but they circle and they stack around the same topic of thought, right? So list of words here is is taken as, as the thought pattern. Or we can, and this is a different type of, a different group of subjects, we can start from the same word, dog, but instead of staying in circles, advance now in an expansive manner, like a conversation you can have with friends over dinner, where we start in one topic and end after two minutes in a remote, uh, very remote topic from there, right? So this is also coherent associations, one, one node to the next, but rather than a circular uh, pattern, just going um, expansively. And we've shown that people in this condition, when you read words that advance uh, and, and go away from, the, from a center and not being circular, actually improves mood significantly. So um, broad, uninhibited mind monitoring is most conducive uh, to a better mood. Okay. The other thing I wanted to say about creativity that's not... Um, common knowledge, I think, is this uh, term we call incubation. So you very often, I'm sure, encounter the situation where you're trying to solve a problem that requires some creative thinking, and then you give up for some reason. You uh, either you're called to some other task or to attend some other issues, and you put this problem behind, and then a solution comes to you out of nowhere. It seems out of nowhere, and there's this aha moment, this insight. So in spite of the subjective feeling that this idea came from, from the skies, it actually came from our uh, subconscious, where, where you left off with this problem, your subconscious continued to generate solutions and try to evaluate them and incubate it on this problem until there is a solution. And when the solution comes, then uh, your, your mind is aware of it. So you have, it's as if you have two minds. And when you think about mind wandering and things I say in the book about meditation, for example, the idea here is really to be able to silent the noise, not silent your thinking, you never stop thinking, but really be able to think less so that you can distinguish a good idea or you can be able to observe when there's a new idea uh, uh, that comes to you. So as I said before, mind wandering is really uh, mediating the representation of the self, theory of mind, the mind of others, associations and simulations. And the simulations actually provide us with an amazing tool of being able to learn from our imagined experiences. So most of what, if not all of what you have in memory is a result, no, or a lot of what we have in our memory is a result of experience. You remember a certain trip you had, or you remember what happened as a, when you were a kid and you touched a flame of uh, fire for the first time, or the taste of a mango, or whatever it is. All these experiences are stored in memory, or some aspects of these experiences are stored in memory, and we're realizing more and more that the real function of memory is not to help us reminisce, but rather to serve the future. So all these experiences by... Um, saving them, we can use them as scripts for, that can guide behavior in future encounters in similar situations. So this is a powerful tool, right? To, to be able to gain from our experience. But what's amazing about our ability to mind wander and simulate possible scenarios is that we can experience in our mind situations from the comfort of our living room without leaving our house, just thinking about possible scenarios. And these scenarios are usually uh, rational and they're based on fragments of your memory that you reconstruct and you, and you reshuffle and you make new scenarios out of. And these simulations then are stored in your memory just like real experiences. And now we have the benefit of not only learning from our real experiences, we can also benefit from imagined experiences. So you can imagine the taste of a um, sandwich with strawberry jam and sardines without having to taste it, right? And now you have this image and you have this imagination of this scenario and you know this is not a scenario you want to encounter and you know how you would behave if you're facing a specific scenario that you already imagined. Uh, so this is really uh, empowering us in, 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 in the repertoire of things we can learn. Not, we don't really have to experience jumping from a window to know that this is not something that we want to do, okay? 
So I want to add in a lengthy um, a slide here that somewhat of an attempt to be uh, practical in the book. I do have, with the advice of my editor, have an, a long appendix of, of uh, suggested ways to take our research and the research by others by research that is detailed in, in the book and try to implement it in our everyday lives. So I realize there is a desire for all of us, it's very natural to be able to say, okay, this is the science. How is this uh, affecting my everyday life? So there are many things there that, that I list about how uh, to deal both with uh, wandering itself and uh, emphasizing creativity, mood, and, and, and immersion in our experiences and so forth. So I cannot really describe everything here, but I just chose a few vignettes to, to emphasize here. So it's kind of a freestyle, but I think all applicable. And of course, there's a Q&A you can uh, ask to drill in on any of them. So the first is really my, my, my good friends uh, thank me for giving them permission to wander by highlighting the good things that happen uh, when we wander, such as creative thinking, simulations, and planning. So I think you should all adopt this uh, point of view that uh, if we recognize a state where our wandering is productive, is, is creative, is interesting, then we shouldn't really feel guilty about it as society might uh, make us feel. And rather, if we can carve out uh, stretches of time where we can actually make time to just wander, just you know, stay in bed extra 10 minutes in the morning and, and, and wander, uh, it's actually a constructive rather than a lazy uh, a trait. The second thing is what I just said in the previous slide, our ability to learn from our imagination. We should respect that and realize that all these scenarios that we make up are not uh, uh, make-believe, but rather really dress, dress rehearsals for uh, uh, scenarios that might, we might encounter and be more ready just because we simulated them in advance. The third, th the, the third thing I call semi-directed mind wandering. The reason I call it semi-directed is because Mind, mind wandering is notoriously uh, uncontrollable. So we can't really decide to start mind wandering and we cannot really decide to stop mind wandering. It's, it's really a beast that has a mind of its own. So while we cannot really control the, the, the pace and the, and, the, and the time that it, that, uh, it is showed up, uh, we, we can keep in mind, and I elaborate this in the book, we can be minded of what is currently occupying us. So if I go for a run and just before I go out of the door, the last things I've done were paying the bills or, annoy, or responding to some annoying email, it's most likely that my, my mind wonder will be occupied with those recent activities. So if you can control some of the content that then you can summon mind wandering, they'll be closer to things you do want to wonder about versus it being completely spontaneous or just depending randomly on things that happened before. So some control is achievable. Um, and then in addition, I detailed there, and I can talk about this a little more, the, what are the conditions that maximize the chances of constructive mind wandering? So it's not only reading in advance things that you want to think about, but it's really what are the conditions that maximize uh, good mind wandering? Is it uh, being less occupied, less loaded, as I mentioned before, less taxes on your mental capacity. Uh, it, it is related to mood, as I showed you with the state of mind and all the slides. So yeah, now that you know everything I told you already, uh, try to think what kind of mind wandering uh, you'll be having if you're in a good mood or in a bad mood, right? What kind of creative, uh, how creative is your mind running going to be when you're in a certain condition of, let's say, thinking locally or, or, or globally? So because all these things are connected with each other, we can start to gain a more understanding of uh, the content of our mind wandering and what affects uh, both the frequency of, of mind wandering and the content and the type of mind wandering, broad versus narrow, etc. Then we talked about inhibition, to, to that, that it really is what determines the breadth of our thought and many things in, our, in, in the way we think. And here I want to introduce the concept of a sensor, that it can be internal or external. So external is easy to, to demonstrate. So think about the brain, brainstorming session. So there's a group of uh, workers trying to come up with a solution for a, a tough problem, and the boss is in the room, and he keeps dismissing ideas, right? He or she. Uh, this is a bad idea. This is stupid. This is not going to work. This is a sensor that really suppresses the divergent thinking I was just talking about, right? So we do want broad thinking. So at the divergent brainstorming part of the creative uh, uh, solution, we do want to be 
carefree and not think about what's right and how am I going to look. And the same thing happens also internally. We have an internal sensor. So in the divergent thinking, we do want to be more um, without suppression, without inhibition, and be more uh, freely thinking without judging ourselves, so to speak. So we don't want this inhibition when we want to create, a, 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 when we want to think broadly and when we want to think creatively. So be minded of the, of the fact that we do have this sensor in the room also here. And the connection between mood and creativity, I think is clear by now. And these are things that we play and, and it, it, you all can play with it as well and kind of look at your creativity when you're in a certain mood. And this really is something that can be translated into everyday world. I can recognize my state of mind to some extent. I don't do it on a moment by moment basis, but I know is this the time for me to sit down and think about a creative solution or should I come back later when I'm in a different mood or I'm in a different state? So being minded of this, even if we don't have much of a control, it already helps us uh, kind of match our state to our task. And as I said before, the mental load is really something that takes away from our CPU, takes, takes away from our 100% of brain and leaves us with less and less and less uh, for creative thinking and for appreciation of our experience. And there is this uh, exploration, exploitation, like I, I mentioned to you, that uh, we can be open uh, and, and sacrifice safety versus closed and safer and, and more efficient. And this, it, this actually maps to the diamond that I described in the context of, of creativity. And there is uh, a concept I didn't elaborate on here, but I love this specific context and uh, concept and it is in detail in the book. It came from Suzuki, some uh, Buddhist uh, scholar that talks about uh, beginner's mind. And I think they, it's self-explanatory if you're not familiar with it already, but the idea here is really that there is an expert and there's a beginner. And they can both be in the same mind. And the beginner comes to Bula Rasa with a, like a white canvas and everything is possible, right? The expert on the one hand, he or she are expert. They can find solutions quicker. They, they can dismiss ideas quicker. Uh, they, can, uh, they can be more productive. But at the same time, they think in borders. They think in templates. They think in things that already worked in the past. And therefore, it limits their ability to, to come up with novel uh, um, solutions and novel uh, uh, thoughts. So we should all remember that we can be uh, um, pretending to have a beginner mind in some situations so that we can approach an, an old problem with, with a new mind. So um, overall, uh, we think about mind wandering and at least before i started to read to write this this book uh the notion was that mind wandering is a bad thing by and large that it's something that takes us away from the moment and indeed it's not a good thing uh, uh spiritually thinking or or the level of experience uh, uh the quality of experience that we want we do want to be in the present but at the same time if you're always in the present we cannot enjoy all the benefits of this mental power tool that helps us simulate and prepare and be creative. So really nature has prioritized our thriving survival over our ability to cherish the moment. With all the respect to cherishing the moment, uh, we do need mind wandering so that we can uh, flourish and, and, uh, and advance and, and be able both to survive and to, and to grow. So I leave it at that. And I think we are good for uh, questions now.